Rockwell says in every speech he makes that that decision was catastrophic for the people of this country and the standards of living and also deeply damaging to our role, status and influence in the world. Mr. Well, Mr. 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 Speaker, I would say gently to the Honourable Member that at the beginning of his question, you think he made the central point. It was seven years ago, Mr. Speaker, and we need to move forward. I would just gently point out to him, he talked about what's happened since then, that since we left the single market, this economy has grown faster than Germany, France and Italy. And he, and he talks about our standing on the world stage. Well, he obviously he wasn't here for our statement on the NATO summit last week, but nobody can be in any doubt that the United Kingdom is highly respected on the world stage. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now then, just last week, the Leader of the Opposition announced his new flagship policy, the two-child benefit cap. goes down very popular on this side of the House but not so popular on that side of the House. But, Prime Minister, could you please tell the House when will the Leader of the Opposition jump off the bandwagon and be honest with the British public and tell them what he stands for? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend, friend is right. Now, it would be one thing... And I say, I, I, welcome, I welcome the Leader of the Opposition now supporting the Government's policy, but I don't think anyone actually believes that he believes in what he's saying. And I think that is the... Just say, you don't need to worry, you've no responsibility for the Opposition. Neil Coyle. Mr Speaker, every single member of this House is required by law to confirm the true source of a donation before it is accepted or declared. So can the Prime Minister tell us if he followed all the rules all the time before he took £38,500 of free air travel on the 28th of April? And if so, why does his story keep changing about who paid? Yeah. Oh, Mr. S Mr Speaker, all, all, all donations are declared in the normal way. And as, and as the Honourable Gentleman knows, if there are administrative changes to that, those are quickly corrected. David Davis. The Prime Minister, back to the question raised quite rightly by my rightful friend, the member for uh, North East Somerset. The opposition politician he was referring to, of course, was Nigel Farage, whose bank account was closed, not because he was a PEP, not because of commercial reasons, but because his views did not align with the values of Coote's Bank, a thinly veiled political discrimination of vindictive, irresponsible and undemocratic action. But in addition... NatWest also disclosed confidential details about Farage's account to BBC and lied about the commercial viability of his account, actions which ought to jeopardise his banking licence and should certainly worry NatWest's 19 million other customers. So he's told us what he's going to do for the future, but there are many other people in this circumstance. So can he require every bank with a British banking licence to inform the Treasury of all the accounts they've shut down for non-commercial reasons in the last decade. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I, I know that the uh, Ronald Gentleman has spoken to the Chancellor about this particular issue and I know he'll continue to have those conversations. In the short term, having consulted on the payment service regulations, we do intend to crack down on this practice by toughening the rules around account closures. Uh, but in the meantime, the Financial Ombudsman Service is available for people to make complaints to, but I look forward to continuing the dialogue with him, as indeed does the Chancellor. Final question, Colonel Lockhart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As a father, the Prime Minister will know how precious children are. Adam Watson, age nine, and Poppy Ogle, age ten, from my constituency, sadly lost their battle with childhood cancer just last year. Their homes are forever broken. Both families want to see a change in financial support for the 1,600 children diagnosed with cancer across the UK each year. Would the Prime Minister commit to meet with those, these families, to listen to their stories and to review child DLA payments to commence immediately on diagnosis of childhood cancer, whether that be a terminal diagnosis or not? The three-month wait for support is just too long. Surely this government can see fit to wrap its arms around these children and their families in their hour of need. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Lady for raising this issue. I can't imagine how difficult it is for families whose children are being treated for cancer and everything that will come along with that. I will happily look into the specific issue that she mentioned and get back to her in all haste, and she should know that she has my total support for helping and supporting families who are going through what will be an unbelievably difficult time. That completes Prime Minister's questions. Well, that was Prime Minister's questions, the final session before the summer recess, and we'll be speaking to our political editor, Beth Rigby, very shortly about what we heard uh, today. But first, some breaking news now on the row between Nigel Farage uh, and Coots Bank. Well, I'm joined uh, here in Westminster by Mark Kleinman, our city editor, and, of course, Nigel Farage claims to have evidence that Coots Bank, a prestigious bank, has closed his accounts because of his political views, not because... He doesn't meet the financial threshold. What are you hearing? Uh, that's right, Sally. What, what's happened in the last few weeks is that this issue about bank account closures for non-financial and commercial reasons has been thrust back into the spotlight, uh, prompting the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, to order a review of the issue by the City Minister, Andrew Griffith. And what I've uh, learned this afternoon is that the Treasury is shortly going to announce a, a sweeping package of reforms uh, to address this issue. Uh, principally, uh, banks will be forced to give customers three months' notice of any account closures uh, that they intend to enforce and to provide their customers with a full explanation of the re reasons for those closures. Now, uh, before now, uh, the, uh, banks have not had to provide uh, such an explanation. And that's intended to address these growing concerns in recent weeks that um, banks are somehow impinging upon freedom of expression uh, you know, crystallised in this example of Nigel Farage, the former UKIP leader, who uh, claims to have produced evidence that Coots, a subsidiary of NatWest, which is backed by British taxpayers, has closed his accounts uh, because his views do not align with the bank's uh, values. Now, uh, as part of the Treasury reforms that will be announced in the coming days, uh, customers will continue to have a, the right of appeal, as the Prime Minister just referred to there in uh, Prime Minister's questions. Uh, the presumption is that if customers are armed with both more time to prepare an appeal but also more information about why their accounts are being closed, that more of their appeals uh, against their bank's decisions will be su successful in due course. Now, uh, there will be a written ministerial statement from the City Minister, Andrew Griffith, in, uh, as I say, in the coming days, certainly in the next couple of weeks, and uh, at that point we will hear more about exactly how the Treasury intends to address this issue more fully. Yeah, certainly. It wasn't a surprise we heard about it in uh, Prime Minister's questions today, and certainly Rishi Sunak backing up what you're hearing from the Treasury, that they do plan to crack down on it. That's Mark, right. thanks so much. Uh, well, let's just bring in our political editor, Beth Rigby, to talk uh, about more about what happened in Prime Minister's questions uh, today. And certainly Rishi Sunak uh, really being grilled by Keir Starmer today on the NHS. Yeah, Rishi Sunak has five pledges, one of them going a bit better today with lower than expected inflation. But instead, what um, Keir Starmer chose to do was to go in on NHS waiting lists. They are at a record high. Uh, he started off with that. They're now at 7.4 million, up 200,000, actually, since when um, Rishi Sunak took over as Prime Minister. But I think, Sally, actually, within that discussion, there was something more telling about going into a general election. And this was the way in which Keir Starmer was trying to pin uh, Rishi Sunak on fiscal discipline. Now, we know that historically Labour have had the problem with voters when it comes to being trusted with public finances. And what we're seeing here from Keir Starmer, not just in that Prime Minister's questions, but this week more broadly, is a would-be Prime Minister trying to signal very clearly to the public ahead of three by-elections on Thursday, but also going into election that he will be careful with public finances. So we've had the row within Labour about sticking with the cap on child benefits, so only two children uh, in a family. If it's a larger family, there's a two-child limit to get in uh, child benefit. He said they're sticking with that policy, knowing that it is going to be unpopular uh, with some people in Labour. Why are they doing that? Because, as someone close to him said to me the other day, uh, it's toxic thinking, as they put it, to think that because you're very far ahead in the polls that you can be more radical uh, with policy ideas. And this is all about fiscal discipline. And what you saw there 
at Prime Minister's questions was the way in which Keir Starmer was trying to pin Rishi Sunak on his long-term workforce plan, which they haven't set out how it will be funded yet. Um, and the Prime Minister saying that we will set that out in the autumn statement, so later this year. Meanwhile, Labour have said very clearly that their workforce plan will be funded by cutting non-DOM status. And what they're trying to do there is try and pin the idea of not being truthful about public finances, not on Labour, but onto the Conservatives, because they know that the next election is going to be so focused on economy. So quite an interesting... Uh, pivot there from Starmer as he tries to imply, and this will be a wider argument going into a general election, that Rishi Sunak is making promises and that will mean for voters either tax rises or more borrowing, or as he said, the magic money tree was once an attack line of the Conservatives to Labour. Now Labour trying uh, to take that on and you can see the battle lines uh, there going into a general election and, and Keir Starmer is so focused on fiscal discipline. As one of his uh, allies said to me, uh, we are going to be, quote, warriors against complacency. And he is really going to sit in the centre ground. Uh, and he was not going to make any spending uh, commitments that are not unfunded because he really wants to convince voters that Labour can be trusted on the economy, it's always a challenge for any Labour Party going into a general election. Uh, yeah, and just briefly, Beth, it was really interesting, wasn't it, that um, obviously the numbers that Rishi Sunak would have loved to have talked about today would be inflation, but if, in, instead he was he was grilled by Keir Starmer on how he would pay for his workforce plan, and there was quite an interesting spat between them about um, maths. Yeah, because Rishi, um, Rishi Sunak... Uh, announced a policy um, earlier this year that all children had to study maths up to the age of 18 in order to make us a more numerical uh, nation. Um, and when uh, Keir Starmer was criticising him for his unfunded spending commitments, um, the Prime Minister said, well, you perhaps shouldn't uh, be doing maths up to 18, maybe up to the age of 61 but he got Keir Starmer's age wrong because Keir Starmer said, I didn't know how old Keir but apparently Keir Starmer's uh, 60. So his maths gag, uh, well, he got the wrong number. So they had You'd a... You'd want to check I mean, that before you made the joke, wouldn't you? Yeah, unless Keir Starmer's in denial and he's actually <laughs> is 61, he just doesn't want to admit it. Like all of us, he's lying about his age. <laughs> I'm definitely in denial about my age, 100%. <laughs> um, let's also have a, a listen to um, Rishi Sunak's comments at, at the start uh, of Prime Minister's questions. He apologised... Uh, to the LGBTQ plus uh, community who'd served... The ban on LGBT people serving in our military until the year 2000 was an appalling failure of the British state, decades behind the law of this land. As today's report makes clear, in that period many endured the most horrific sexual abuse and violence. Homophobia... ...be funded... ...yet. Um, and the Prime Minister saying that we will set that out in the autumn statement, so later this year. Meanwhile, Labour have said very clearly that their workforce plan will be funded by cutting non-DOM status. And what they're trying to do there is try and pin the idea of not being truthful about public finances, not on Labour, but onto the Conservatives, because they know that the next election is going to be so focused on economy. So quite an interesting... Uh, pivot there from Starmer as he tries to imply, and this will be a wider argument going into a general election, that Rishi Sunak is making promises and that will mean for voters either tax rises or more borrowing, or as he said, the magic money tree was once an attack line of the Conservatives to Labour. Now Labour trying uh, to take that on and you can see the battle lines uh, there going into a general election and, and Keir Starmer is so focused on fiscal discipline. As one of his uh, allies said to me, uh, we are going to be, quote, warriors against complacency. And he is really going to sit in the centre ground. Uh, and he was not going to make any spending uh, commitments that are not unfunded, because he really wants to convince voters that Labour can be trusted 
on the economy, it's always a challenge for any Labour Party going into a general election. Uh, yeah, and just briefly, Beth, it was really interesting, wasn't it, that um, obviously the numbers that Rishi Sunak would have loved to have talked about today would be inflation, but if, in, instead he was he was grilled by Keir Starmer on how he would pay for his workforce plan, and there was quite an interesting spat between them about um, maths. Yeah, because Rishi, um, Rishi Sunak... Uh, announced a policy um, earlier this year that all children had to study maths up to the age of 18 in order to make us a more numerical uh, nation. Um, and when uh, Keir Starmer was criticising him for his unfunded spending commitments, um, the Prime Minister said, well, you perhaps shouldn't uh, be doing maths up to 18, maybe up to the age of 61 but he got Keir Starmer's age wrong because Keir Starmer said, I didn't know how old Keir but apparently Keir Starmer's uh, 60. So his maths gag, uh, well, he got the wrong number. So they had You'd a... You'd want to check I mean, that before you made the joke, wouldn't you? Yeah, unless Keir Starmer's in denial and he's actually <laughs> is 61, he just doesn't want to admit it. Like all of us, he's lying about his age. <laughs> I'm definitely in denial about my age, 100%. <laughs> um, let's also have a, a listen to um, Rishi Sunak's comments at, at the start uh, of Prime Minister's questions. He apologised... Uh, to the LGBTQ plus uh, community who'd served uh, in the military for their treatment. The ban on LGBT people serving in our military until the year 2000 was an appalling failure of the British state, decades behind the law of this land. As today's report makes clear, in that period many endured the most horrific sexual abuse and violence, homophobic bullying and harassment, all while bravely serving this country. Today, on behalf of the British state, I apologise. The Labour in government was proud to repeal the ban against LGBT plus people serving in our armed forces. Yeah. And today, we strongly welcome this apology from the Prime Minister as a recognition of their historic mistreatment. Mr Speaker, my constituent, Ken Wright, was a proud RAF serviceman forced to leave the job he loved simply because he was gay. I'm delighted he is here today to witness this apology. Yeah. And whilst we cannot right the wrongs of the past, the government should now act on the recommendations of the Etherton Review to fix the lives broken by the ban. It's what LGBT plus veterans deserve. That was quite uh, moving, mm. um, those statements in the Commons, uh, Beth. Certainly, it's almost hard to believe, isn't it, that the members of the LGBTQ plus community couldn't even serve in the armed I mean, forces it, until it, 2000. It is actually astonishing, um, and it shows how far we have come uh, in a relatively short period of time. But this is... This is um, that, that exchange you saw there... Uh, it was an apology that was made after a recommendation from a government-commissioned report that has been published today, apologising for the historic, uh, the horrific historical treatment uh, of gay and, and lesbian and, and, and trans people and, and bisexual people that were were um, banned from serving in the armed forces between uh, 1967 to, to up to 2000, um, and there will be a statement. Uh, I think, in the Commons later today from the Defence Secretary, um, Ben Wallace. But you saw there uh, the Prime Minister making that apology following uh, the recommendation in that report and then, of course, being reinforced there by Sir Keir Starmer. OK, the final PMQs before the summer break. Great We're out of here. <laughs> Great to see you. Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.